Okay, so continuing on here uh, with the part one, uh, like I said at the beginning of the last lecture, there are sort of three major points Rousseau wants to make in a way throughout part one of the discourse on inequality, but especially in this last half or so. Uh, human beings in the state of nature, he says, first of all, they are not uh, social at all. Uh, they have brief connections to have sex, uh, relatively brief family life. When, when, the, when, when the woman gives birth to the child, there is some connection between the mother and child. Eventually, though, when, when the child can get food for itself, it just wanders off, and that's the end of that. So human beings have no natural sociability, no natural connection to each other, and certainly no natural uh, dependence on one another. So, I mean, another way you could say is that he says human beings are naturally free. Uh, what does it mean for human beings to be naturally free? It means that they're not dependent on each other in, in any way except when they're children. Um, he also says uh, human beings in the state of nature are essentially just animals, especially in terms of their mental development. Uh, they do not have complex ideas. They don't have abstract ideas at all. They don't have language. They have very, very simple, very, very limited minds, and therefore they have very, very simple and limited desires for very basic, very real uh, essential needs and, and pleasures like food, water, rest, and again, occasionally sex. So he says, you know, in, in the state of nature, they are very simple mentally, and therefore they are very simple, simple emotionally. They, they, they don't have intense desires unless they're really hungry for some reason, and they don't have desires for, for anything that, that doesn't exist in the state of nature, and they don't have any sense of self. They, they don't have pride, they don't have anxiety, they don't have any of those feelings. Uh, and finally, he says, in the state of nature, human beings are naturally uh, compassionate. They, they're, they're, there's a natural pity. They, they don't like to harm others unless they absolutely have to, because their own preservation is somehow at stake. And they, they, they just, in general, don't like to, to see people suffer, other animals suffer, and again, they especially don't like to harm them in, unless there's some particular reason uh, that they absolutely have to uh, for their own self-preservation. Uh, and, and again, these, these, these three ideas are connected. Part of the reason that human beings are naturally compassionate, uh, the reason that, that they have natural pity, that they're in a way naturally gentle is because they don't rely on, on one another at all. They're not dependent on anybody. Therefore, they have no reason to try to harm or dominate anybody because they don't need anything from them. And they have no reason to be angry at them. And there, there's, there's no real competition over uh, abstract things, even things as abstract as pride, because Rousseau says that doesn't exist in the state of nature. The, 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 the whole concept, the whole feeling, the whole emotion, experience of pride doesn't exist at all in the state of nature, because human beings are not self-conscious enough for that. Uh, they, they don't, they don't uh, have any experience of themselves in that abstract way to feel as if they've somehow been insulted or offended by something. So even if there's direct conflict between them and another person over food, for instance, even if there, there's, there are physical uh, uh, violence, of blows are exchanged and so on, one of them gets knocked down the hill, uh, they're, they're fighting over you know, uh, uh, an apple or something and, and on the top of a hill, and one of them punches the other one and knocks him down the hill. The one who gets knocked down the hill just says, well, now I have to go find something else to eat. He has no desire for vengeance. That doesn't even make any sense. Uh, and he has no sense of pride. He has no sense of having somehow been insulted or offended. If, if a third person sees him, he doesn't feel embarrassed. He doesn't feel like he has to go back up the hill now and attack this person to somehow save face. None of that exists in the state of nature, Rousseau says. Uh, and in fact, on the contrary, in the state of nature, this third person who's watching doesn't, doesn't, doesn't uh, despise the person who was knocked down the hill, doesn't think less of them, doesn't, doesn't think that they've been embarrassed in any way. If anything, they feel a kind of pity for that person. They, they feel bad, they, they, they feel pity, they feel discomfort seeing that person struck and seeing them suffer. Uh, and so Rousseau develops that, in particular in this next section that, that, that we're going to talk about here, this idea of natural pity, specifically he, he sort of addresses and responds to Hobbes. Uh, so he sort of says on page 96, after he's done sort of talking about language and so on, he says, look, let, let's not assume that natural man is either virtuous or vicious. He says, you know, let, let, let's not get into the whole thing. He's just been talking about how he thinks that in the state of nature, human beings would be happier, as he says, you know, what kind of misery uh, can there be for a free being whose heart is at peace and whose body is in health? So he's talked about, you know, again, by, by nature, in the state of nature, human beings are free. And he says, again, they, 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 they have their, their, their heart is at peace. They don't desire anything they can't have. They're not even aware of anything beyond what they see in front of them and things that they can't have, food and so on. Uh, and their body is in health because, again, he says, really most sicknesses are caused by civilization. So he says, certainly the, 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 the life of, of human beings in the state of nature or, or the life of savages today in very primitive uh, uh, types of societies that are still very close to nature, 
Uh, he says these these people are happy. Uh, he says it's it's people in, in civilized uh, life, people who who live in in uh, developed societies are the ones who are miserable, who are constantly worried and anxious and, and wanting things that they can't have and disappointed when when they get them and so on. He says that's none of that is is uh, anything like the experience of of natural humanity or of human beings living in in this sort of uh, first uh, relatively still relatively primitive, still relatively natural uh, type of type of community. Um, but he says, you know, so moving on from whether or not they're happy, he says, let's not get into whether natural man is, is either virtuous or vicious right here. Let's suspend judgment on that. And he says, well, then we should ask, you know, is civilized man actually more virtuous than vicious? Is it true that people living in society are somehow more virtuous than they are vicious? And he'll go on and he'll argue, no, they're not. And, and in fact, natural man is more virtuous because, again, natural man is still closer to that feeling of natural pity. And in, this, in, in the rest of part one, Rousseau goes on and argues that really all of the good things that you see in society, all of the virtues, all of the benevolence, all of the humanity, all of that comes from this natural pity that hasn't yet been completely extinguished. Everything in civilized man that comes from civilization, that, that comes from living in society, Rousseau says is actually bad. It's negative, it, it makes them uh, unhappy, and it makes them wicked. But, he says, it's, it's this natural pity which still exists in people, in some more than others, but it's this natural pity which is the only source of anything good, any virtue in, in society, in civilized human beings. Um, <clears throat> so he, he, he responds to Hobbes here, he says, you know, let's not conclude with Hobbes uh, these, ver these various negative things about natural man, about human nature. Uh, above all, that as Rousseau says, that on the strength of the right he reasonably claims to things he needs, he foolishly imagines himself to be the sole proprietor of the whole universe. Remember, that was one of the things that Hobbes came back to again and again, that human beings vastly, enormously overrate their own importance, and that to some extent they even think that somehow the world exists just for them. Uh, and, and, and Hobbes says, therefore, in the state of nature, you have competition over things that people need, but also uh, uh, conflict over glory, over people thinking that they're so important and wanting to avenge themselves when people don't, don't show them enough respect. And Rousseau says, that doesn't make any sense. It's perfectly reasonable that, that people would have a claim to things that they need. If they need food, if they need water, they have a claim to these things. If there's conflict over them, and again, Rousseau says for the most part there won't be because the, the, the state of nature, the, the, the natural condition is one of plenty. But he says, you know, if there is occasional conflict over these things, it's reasonable for, for people to fight for something that they need. But he says th they're not going to somehow from that go to some foolish, bizarre, uh, sort of completely um, irrational belief that they somehow therefore are, as he puts it, the sole proprietor of the whole universe, that somehow the entire world exists for them. So he says this enormous pride, this enormous vainglory that Hobbes uh, attributes to human nature, Rousseau says isn't there. Now again, Rousseau himself, remember in that, in that note I, uh, talks about how bad civilization makes people, how bad society makes people, and says, you know, that, that uh, civilized man, he might enjoy all kinds of prosperity, all kinds of treasures, and so on, but as Rousseau says, he'll end by slitting everybody's throat simply so he can be master of the universe. So Rousseau largely agrees with Hobbes about what people are like now, about how bad things are for us, about how bad, you know, uh, about just the, the, the reality of human beings as they are now, as they are in society. But Rousseau is just saying that's not actually natural, that, 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 that doesn't come from human nature, it comes from the way that, that, that civilization, society, the loss of natural freedom, the, the, the creation of uh, permanent uh, dependence and, and hierarchy and, and loss of freedom and so on, he says, that's where all this stuff comes from. It's not natural, it, it's not actually in human nature. Um, so again, he largely agrees with, what, with Hobbes about what people are, are like in society, about the people that they saw around them. The difference is just what is the cause of this? Hobbes says it's human nature, Rousseau says it's not human nature, it's, it's, it's the, 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 the result, the uh, influence, the product of, of living in society. And so why is that significant? In part, you know, as you have uh, a nature then as a standard to, uh, to evaluate society to say how bad is this, but also to know, okay, to the extent that people are good, what is the cause of that? How, 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 can, we, how can we kind of focus on that? How can we focus on the cause of good? We have to know, well, what is it? Is it laws that people make for themselves in society or is it in fact natural impulses in people? Um, so anyways, so Rousseau, again, criticizing Hobbes, uh, disagreeing with him, as, as he says um, at, the, uh, at the bottom of page uh, uh, 98, he says, reasoning on his own principles, that writer, Hobbes, ought to have said that the state of nature, being the state where man's care for his own preservation is least prejudicial to that of others, 
is the one most conducive to peace and the most suited to mankind. So Rousseau says, in fact, Hobbes himself should have said that in the state of nature, uh, humanity's care for his own, each individual's care for his own preservation is the least prejudicial to others. Therefore, it's the best condition for human beings. There is no real need for conflict. There, there is no real reason for, for people to fight because they can, they can satisfy their own very basic needs without any conflict with anybody else. Uh, Rousseau goes on and he says, Hobbes said precisely the opposite as a, as a result of introducing, illogically, into the savage man's care for his own preservation, the need to satisfy a multitude of passions which are the product of society and which have made laws necessary. So again, goes back to that point that Rousseau makes at the very beginning, or near the very beginning of the book, uh, as he says, you know, all previous philosophers have set out to describe natural man, but they've actually described civil man. He says that's what Hobbes did. When, when he talked about the state of nature, he had people constantly, it was a war of all against all, because they were fighting over things that don't actually exist in the state of nature. They were fighting over things, over, over passions, over desires that only exist in society. And he says, and it's, it's, this, it's, these, these, it's these passions that are created in society which, which make uh, laws necessary, that, that really change people and make them uh, uh, tend, to, uh, ten, tend to really fight each other. Again, this, as he puts it, this multitude of passions that are created in society, things like pride, things like, like the, 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 the desire to have more than you need. Rousseau says none of this is natural. All of this is simply created by society. Um, so, so he says, you know, Hobbes, again, misunderstood natural humanity by putting all of these things uh, that exist only in society in the state of nature and therefore had all this conflict in the state of nature over things, over passions, over desires, and so on, which would never actually exist in the state of nature. So again, you know, Rousseau says, you know, human beings are naturally, in fact, good, he says. So he goes on again, continues to criticize Hobbes. He says, the wicked man, according to Hobbes, is a robust child. In other words, a, a child, someone as selfish, as uh, self-centered and, and, and obsessed simply with their own needs and, and their own wants and so on, as, as a small child, as, as a baby, basically. But it's like a strong, it's robust. It's, it's like a, a baby that is strong enough to actually act on those desires. Um, and so, so in Hobbes had said that, that the wicked man can be compared to a robust child. Uh, a wicked man, someone who just acts in a selfish way, is like a child, selfish, but strong enough to actually act. Not, not, not strong and it to, can't just sit there and cry, it can actually just go out and take things from people. Uh, but Rousseau says, it remains to be seen whether man in a state of nature is this robust child. In other words, okay, that's a wicked man is like a robust child, selfish like a child, strong enough to act on those selfish impulses. But Rousseau says, is man in the state of nature like that? Is man in the state of nature uh, uh, as, as selfish and as potentially cruel and, and, and uh, wicked and so on as, as a child is? Because, because of being selfish? Uh, is, is, in other words, again, is natural man wicked? Is, is naturally man morally bad? Uh, and Rousseau says, even if we grant that, that man in the state of nature is, is like a robust child, what would Hobbes conclude from that? As, as Rousseau puts it, that if this man were as dependent on others when he is robust as when he is feeble, there is no kind of excess to which he would not resort. But, Rousseau says, two conflicting suppositions are here being made about man in the state of nature, that he is robust and that he is dependent. So in other words, Rousseau says the whole reason that children are so selfish and are constantly crying and trying to get people to do what they want is because they're dependent on, on, on other people. If you make them robust, if you make them strong enough to satisfy their own needs, they're, they're, they're not going to be selfish. They're, they're not going to throw temper tra tantrums. They're not going to try to control other people. They're, they're, they're not going to throw things and so on because they don't need anything. It's only because they, they need things from other people that they try to control them and do these things. Rousseau says if you take away the dependency, then people, will, then people are not wicked. The only reason that they have to be wicked is because they somehow rely on or depend on this person, and therefore controlling or dominating them becomes very important. But Rousseau says, take away that dependency. Make somebody robust and, and you know, again, strong, strong enough to, to, to just uh, answer their own needs, satisfy their own needs without relying on anybody else. And Rousseau says, they have no reason to harm anybody else. They're not going to fight anything because they, 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 they can get things themselves. And they're not going to try to control or dominate or hurt anybody because they don't need these people for anything. So Rousseau says if people are genuinely robust, then, then they're not going to be wicked. Much, wicked. much of the wickedness in human beings, he says, comes from being dependent, comes from needing other people and therefore feeling the need to control them or to harm them in some way. Uh, and he says, again, take away that dependence and you take away the wickedness. Uh, what you have is someone who's capable of satisfying their own needs and therefore has no real reason to, to attack anybody else, uh, to be in conflict with anyone else. So 
He goes on and makes this further point, as he says on page 99, Thus, one could say that savages are not wicked precisely because they do not know what it is to be good. For it is neither the development of intelligence nor the restraint of the laws, but the calm of the passions and the ignorance of vice which prevents them from doing evil. So again, as he says, savages are not wicked, natural human beings not wicked, uh, in, but that's be almost because they don't know what it is to be good. Their life is so simple that they haven't even advanced to the stage where there's, there's a choice between good. Be, be, th th it's as if their life is so simple that they haven't even advanced to the stage of having a choice between being good and being wicked. He says they don't even know what that means. They don't, mean they, they don't know what it would mean to be good. They don't know what it would mean to be bad or wicked, and so they're not wicked. He says it's, it's not due to the development of their intelligence. It's not because they've, they've developed intellectually to understand why I should act this way, what is good, and so on, nor the restraint of the laws. There are no laws. It's the calm of the passions and the ignorance of vice. It's the fact that their passions are relatively calm, and therefore they're not frenzied. They're not doing terrible things because they're over, over, overwhelmed or consumed by, by really strong but, but bad or destructive passions. And again, the ignorance of vice. They don't even know... What, what what would I do? Why would I what 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 you know what if I wanted to be wicked? What would that even mean? I don't know. I I, I don't necessarily even know what vice would be. So that they're not going to be drawn to something. Again, so so again, this idea that because uh, human beings in the state of nature have very calm passions because they don't really know a lot about about what could happen wh about what people later learn about uh, in civil society. Uh, th they have no real reason to do evil because again, their minds and therefore their passions are not developed enough that they can even understand why would it be attractive to me to hurt people in this way? Why would it be attractive to me to take from this? Why would I go and take someone else's fish when I can simply get my own? So sh I mean, certainly not because I just want to feel more powerful than them. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, considerations like that, emotions like that, Rousseau says, don't exist in the state of nature. They do in society, but not in the state of nature. Um, and then he goes on his final criticism of Hobbes. There is, moreover, another principle which Hobbes failed to notice. Uh, and he says even this most cynical commentator on human nature, Bernard Mandeville, who wrote a fairly famous book called The Fable of the Bees, in which he argued that basically human society, human beings are entirely or almost entirely selfish and self-interested. Society is simply a way of finding a way to make these self-interested individuals work together. Obviously, you know, sounds something like Hobbes. Um, and he says, you know, even, even Mandeville, though, in The Fable of the Bees, has a story about an imprisoned man who, who sees a, a mother holding her child and sees a wolf come up and, and, and you know, tear the child out of the mother's arms and t tear it up and eat it. And, and uh, Rousseau says even Mandeville had to admit that this person watching this, though he's completely safe, doesn't know these people, has nothing to do with them, would still be overwhelmed with, with anguish and, and pain and basically compassion feel great pity for this mother and for this child, seeing them suffer in that way. And Rousseau says that's what Hobbes forgot about. There's this basic principle of, of fundamental compassion or pity in human beings. He says, in fact, it's in various other animals. He gives examples, not, not really that important whether or not you believe them. Um, but he says, you know, it, 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 there is basic natural compassion in human beings, and even the most cynical observers will recognize it. We'll see that you know there, there, there's a reason why, that, that, or not even a reason why, just that, that, that people sort of, if somebody sees somebody else suffering, even if it doesn't if directly affect them, they feel bad. They feel some kind of pity. Um, and, and Rousseau says that's, that's a remnant of, of nature. That, that's a remnant of what it was actually like to be, cl to, to, to be living in the state of nature, this natural impulse of pity, because Rousseau basically says there's no way you can understand how civil society would have ever produced that in people. That feeling of pity, Rousseau says, it would never come from society. If you look at society, what you see is all kinds of crazy things, but nothing that would actually make people compassionate or, or, or feel pity for one another. Rousseau says that has to be natural because we simply can't account for it otherwise. Civil society is all about domination and, and inequality and pursuing all kinds of uh, uh, passions and so on that, that are not necessarily... Uh, uh, necessary or, or fundamental or anything, he says, but what you would never be able to figure out is why society or how society would somehow make us feel actual uh, discomfort, anxiety, anguish when we see somebody else suffering. Um, and he says, you know, the compassion or pity is even stronger in the state of nature than it is in civil society. We can still see it somewhat in civil society, in, in, in society, in a more uh, socially developed uh, situation, but it's even stronger in the state of nature, he says. Uh, he says, it is reason which breeds pride and reflection which fortifies it. Reason which turns man inward into himself. Reason which separates him from everything which troubles or affects him. 
So he says it's reason which breeds pride, uh, reason which turns people in to on themselves and, and separates them, sort of uh, isolates them from the others, from, from other human beings. So in the state of nature, people didn't need each other and they were kind of on their own. But Rousseau says in society, reason can really turn people inward on themselves. It really separates or isolates them from other people in a much more fundamental way than was ever the case in the state of nature. In the state of nature, people didn't need each other. They were kind of, you know, indifferent to each other. But in civil society, people even become kind of isolated from one another, really broken off. They, they don't even feel any kind of natural connection, which Rousseau says people in the state of nature would have. He says, reason which separates him from everything which troubles or affects him. So it's reason which enables you to say, I feel this, it bothers me, but I shouldn't. I, I can come up with a reason why this shouldn't actually bother me. Uh, so he says, you know, as, he, as Rousseau then Rousseau says in the next sentence, it is philosophy which isolates a man and prompts him to say in secret at the sight of another suffering, perish if you will, I am safe. So he says it's reason, it's philosophy which says, even though I have this, this, this natural impulse of pity, this natural feeling of compulsion, I know that I'm safe. When I see another person suffering, as long as I know that I'm safe, I can convince myself to ignore that voice or that feeling of pity. Because again, reason tells me I'm safe. As he says, perish if you will, I am safe. Uh, he, he gives a very kind of uh, sarcastic picture of philosophers talking about their, their, their duties to all of mankind and so on. And yet, hearing someone being murdered outside of their window and just ignoring it. Because uh, again, he says, you know, that's, that's what reason can do. Reason can kind of, again, separate you from, from, uh, from, from, from nature. And one of the most fundamental things that it separates you from, one of the most fundamental natural things that it, that it silences or, or you know, paves over or, or, or cuts you off from, is, is this natural feeling of pity. Um, so he, as he says, a fellow man may with impunity be murdered under his window, the, the window of a philosopher. For the philosopher has only to put his hands over his ears and argue a little with himself to prevent nature which rebels inside him from making him identify himself with the victim of the murder. So again, Rousseau says, reason, philosophy can be used to sort of silence nature and to say, well, I'm not that person. So even though I feel some, some pity, some anguish at hearing them suffer, I know that I'm not them, so I can just ignore that. Whereas Rousseau says, the actual natural impulse is, is morally better. It's actual compassion. You actually want to stop that person from suffering. But Rousseau says reason can talk us out of that relatively easily. Reason can corrupt and, and again, just kind of silence nature altogether. Um, and he goes on and he says, you know, the pity is extremely important. He goes on and, and throughout the rest of this passage, again, even kind of argues that almost anything that's morally good in human beings comes from pity. Uh, in particular, again, the idea, as he puts it in the preface, that there are two basic fundamental principles in human nature, uh, the, the impulse, uh, the, the, the desire, but again, it's not just a desire, it's really kind of a fundamental instinct or impulse for self-preservation, but also natural pity. And pity makes us say that, that, that whenever possible, we should never harm somebody unless we absolutely have to. We should never harm another living thing unless our own, our own well-being, our own uh, self-preservation somehow is at stake. <coughs> so as he goes on and says, he says, you know, it's pity is this natural sentiment, moderates the activity of self-love, this sort of uh, self-concern, this sort of uh, love for oneself, this, this desire to, to, to do what's best for oneself. Uh, as he says, um, he says, you know, a robust savage, a strong person in the state of nature, a savage would never rob a child or an old man of his food if he thought there was any chance he could get his own. Uh, whereas, again, in, in civil society, people might take things in, in society. Once people are developed, they might rob people all the time. They might take things from vulnerable people all the time. It happens all the time. You know, just look around you, so would say. Uh, in, in, in society, people don't, don't, don't hesitate at all to, to, to exploit the vulnerable, to take from them, and so on. But Rousseau says, in the state of nature, people would never do that. If they saw a child eating, an old man who couldn't defend himself eating something, Rousseau says, the, the savage would never go and take that from him, uh, unless he was absolutely himself starving. But if he thought he had any chance to go get his own, he wouldn't harm somebody else in that way. Uh, and so as he says, it is pity which, in place of that noble maxim of rational justice, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, inspires all men with this other maxim of natural goodness, much less perfect, but perhaps more useful. Do good to yourself with as little possible harm to others. So Rousseau says that that, that noble maxim of rational justice, treat everybody the, the, the way that you want to be treated, do unto others as, as, you, would, uh, uh, as, as you would have them do unto you. Um, Rousseau says that's, that's noble, it's rational, it makes sense. You. It's only consistent to treat other people the way that you want them to treat you. 
Uh, but he says there's this other one, maybe it's less perfect, maybe it's less noble, maybe it's less moral, but maybe it's much more useful because maybe it's much more something that, that people are likely to do. Do good to yourself with as little possible harm to others. So you're going to do good, do good, good for yourself. That's what human beings are. That's how they act. But do it with as little possible harm to others. And Rousseau says if every, you know, kind of suggesting if people all acted that way, the world would be such a much better place if, if, if they really did try to, to do good for themselves, doing as little possible harm to others, the world would be a completely different place and would be much better. But Rousseau says it's pity, it's natural pity, it's this natural feeling of compassion which makes people act that way when they do. It makes them think, of course I'm going to do good for myself, of course I'm going to do this thing that I have to, but I'm going to do it harming others as, as, as absolutely little as possible. Um, so he says, you know, that's, that's where pity comes from. Again, this is less perfect, less impressive, but probably more useful. Do good to yourself with as little possible harm as others. Again, he says it's natural pity. It's compassion, which, which, restrain, which restrains people, which stops them from simply going out and doing what's best for them, even if it really harms other people. That makes them think maybe they're, 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 there's another way to get this. I need to eat, but I don't want to, you know, hurt this person, so I'm going to go find another way to do it. Um, so he goes on, he says, in a word, it is to this natural feeling rather than to subtle arguments, that we must look for the origin of that repugnance which every man would feel against doing evil, even independently of the maxims of education. So he says, you know, even uneducated people feel a certain repugnance against doing evil, especially, you know, cruelty, he's basically saying, harming people for no reason, but really harming them in general, he says, they're, they're, there's a kind of natural repugnance that people feel towards that. And he says, it's not because they've been taught, it's not because they're rational, it's because of natural feeling. Although it may be proper for Socrates and other minds of that class to acquire virtue through reason, the human race would long since have ceased to exist if its preservation had depended only on the reasoning of the individuals who compose it. So then he goes even further, he says, Socrates maybe could have reasoned everything out, would know to be moral, would know what the right thing is to do based solely on having discovered it through reason. But Rousseau says for the vast majority of human beings and for the human race as a whole, natural feeling is the only guide. He says that <laughs> the entire human race would have perished a long time ago if it had to rely on reason to, to get people to actually act correctly to stop from killing each other, basically. He says, you know, it's only this natural impulse, this natural feeling of, of pity. Uh, so sort of summing up what he says here, uh, language and family are not natural. Uh, they, they don't exist in the state of nature. They, they are only the product of later developments. Cruelty is not natural because cruelty and, and the desire to master or to dominate others comes only from dependence. So you only want to hurt somebody as a way of controlling them, as a way of dominating them only when you're somehow dependent on them, only when you need something from them and, you, and you're trying to assure that through harming them. Uh, and none of that would have existed, he says, in the state of nature. Again, in the state of nature, people were free, and therefore being free, they, they, they didn't have any reliance, they didn't have any uh, dependence on anybody else, and again, they, they certainly weren't themselves being somehow controlled or dominated by anybody else. Moreover, he says, there's the natural feeling of compassion. Uh, which he says ultimately, you know, does restrain people from doing all kinds of terrible things that they might do otherwise. So it's not just that they have no particular motive to be cruel or, or, or you know, uh, violent or anything in the, in the state of nature, because they don't need to be, they, they don't need anything from other people, but there's natural compassion which actually serves as, as a check on that. So again, he says, by nature, human beings are good. Natural man, natural humanity is good, is morally good, because they have no reason to be bad, and, and this natural compassion stops them from being bad if they ever do have some kind of an impulse. Um, so he's basically has shown, argued in this first chapter, uh, that, that, that again, that, that, that natural humanity is good, and that natural humanity, human beings, man in the state of nature, is you know, radically different from, from what, what, what we see around us today, from what we may have taken to be human nature, just looking at our own time and at, at uh, recorded history. Again, that's Rousseau's criticism of all previous philosophers. Uh, so he's shown all of this. He kind of wraps up a few things at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, chapter. He says maybe one last uh, idea, one last reason that people might think there would be conflict in the state of nature over love. But Rousseau says in the state of nature there is no love, there is no preference. Those passions don't really exist. Nobody is fighting over over jealousy, nobody is fighting over infidelity, nobody is, you know, killing each other for any of that, because again, Rousseau says in the state of nature, there is none of that. Uh, love doesn't exist, attachment, uh, devotion, uh, a sort of preference for one person over others, none of that exists, and therefore none of these things can be causes of conflict. If, if sex is seen as simply a natural uh, desire that, that comes and then is satisfied and then goes, 
then then th there's there's no reason to become violent about any of that any more than there is over food or anything like that. So he says, you know, th th there is no love, therefore there is no jealousy, and therefore there is no violence about these things in the state of nature. Um, he says, you know, servitude or slavery in the state of nature. He says that that makes no sense. Uh, why would people dominate each other? Why would they be cruel in that way in the state of nature? It's more effort. It's more risk. I mean, you know, why would you? Who's so lazy that that the, they're going to somehow, or but also so rash and so it's it's a weird mixture. On the one hand, they don't want to have to do anything themselves. They want to slave. On the other hand, they're 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 willing to to put all this effort into constantly watching this person so they don't run away, and they're willing to take the risk that the person will turn on them and kill them or kill them when they're asleep. Rousseau says none of it makes any sense. There would be no slavery in the state of nature. There would be no no uh, inequality, no domination of that kind at all. Um, and again, he says it's it's uh, it's. Uh, uh, dependence that creates inequality and dependence was pretty much impossible in the state of nature. So there would be no way to enslave anybody because the person would just disappear. They don't need anything and, and there's, there, there's not enough to sort of stop them from getting away. As he puts it on page 106 of this translation, um, without expanding uselessly on these details, anyone must see that since the bonds of servitude are formed only through the mutual dependence of men and the reciprocal needs that unite them, it is impossible to enslave a man without first putting him in a situation where he cannot do without another man. And since such a situation does not exist in the state of nature, each man there is free of the yoke, and the law of the strongest is rendered vain. So he says, you know, sometimes people say in the state of nature the strong would exploit the weak, but he says that that's not possible unless the weak were somehow dependent on the strong, but they're not. Uh, therefore, this, this whole idea doesn't make sense because you can't enslave someone unless they somehow are dependent on you, unless they've somehow lost their basic uh, natural freedom in the sense of the, the ability you know, that, that they don't have to rely on anybody. They don't have to rely on you for, for food or for anything else. Once they simply slip away, then, then they can fend for themselves again. <coughs> so Rousseau says, there was no slavery in the state of nature. There was none of this. None of this makes sense. Uh, so again, and then so he says, you know, again, so he's sort of shown humanity in the state of nature naturally good. No violence, no slavery, no domination, uh, no real reason to harm each other at all. And again, a, a very powerful uh, uh, emotional or, or uh, 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 passionate uh, check on all of that in the form of natural pity or natural compassion, uh, a sort of natural repugnance at causing harm to anybody else. Uh, and so Rousseau says, in you know, overall, or really in every way, uh, human beings in the state of nature were superior to human beings in society. So having shown all of that and having given his idea of, of what human beings were like in the state of nature, at the very end of part one, he says, so now I'm going to go and, and, and explain how I think that we came to be, uh, how we came to leave the state of nature and to uh, arrive at, at the state that we're in now. And he says that will be somewhat speculative, but I will sort of lay this out now in, in part two, explain how this progress happened.